Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of circulation, and this is recording part two. The next stop in our journey is to discuss IV fluid therapy. We will start with crystalloids. These are fluids that contain very small molecules like salts and glucose. Crystalloids can be hypo, hyper, or isotonic. And there are many different crystalloids available. We will focus on just a few of them. The first is normal saline, or 0.9% sodium chloride. As we have discussed and we'll see further, normal saline is not ideal and not normal. Even though we saw that its osmolarity is just over 300 and very close to normal physiologic osmolarity, there's too much chloride in it and it lacks a buffer to maintain pH. Sodium chloride in large doses can cause metabolic acidosis and lower plasma bicarbonate. Too much sodium, cl sodium chloride can also increase risk of renal injury, reduce gut perfusion, and may increase postoperative nausea and vomiting. The second crystalloid is lactated ringers, which many consider ideal for perioperative fluid management. It is slightly hypotonic with an osmolarity in the 250 to 270 range. It can be vasodilatory, inflammatory, and it contains potassium, which may be a consideration in patients with renal disease. It contains lactate, which is metabolized to bicarbonate in the liver. A third crystalloid you may see is called plasmolite, an improved version of lactated ringers. In plasmolite, the chloride is even closer to normal. It does contain potassium and magnesium, and it has better buffering capacity due to the presence of gluconate. Plasmolite does not have lactate, and therefore patients who have liver injury or liver transplant uh, would be able to manage this fluid better than lactated ringers. <clears throat> Remember the topic of tonicity, and tonicity determines how these fluids are distributed over time. Before we discuss that, I need to clarify that distribution of fluids out of the intravascular space and into other body compartments depends on a lot of variables. Those are going to include the integrity of the glycocalyx, which we'll discuss a little bit later, volume status, which is the patient's capillary hydrostatic pressure, other effects of anesthesia and surgery and trauma and illness and hemorrhage. In short, distribution of fluids throughout the body is context sensitive. When we initially give patients IV crystalloid, it accumulates in the central compartment where we infuse it. And eventually it will distribute throughout the body to the periphery or be eliminated as urine. So that means that a load of crystalloid, a bolus that is given initially, exerts a pretty substantial volume expansion effect in the intravascular space. And of course, this will be even more pronounced during periods of low pressure or bleeding compared with normal healthy states. But the effect is transitory. Over time, the crystalloids will redistribute throughout the body. And that initial increase in intravascular volume will go away. Colloids, as we'll see momentarily, may have a more prolonged effect on intravascular volume if they are slower to diffuse out of the intravascular space. Now, isotonic fluids are not going to pull fluid from the intracellular fluid, so they're not going to cause any fluid to move out of the cells. All of the fluids that we commonly use are relatively isotonic, normal saline, lactated ringers, and plasmolite. So these fluids, when administered, will expand the extracellular fluid, which is your plasma volume and the interstitial space. Therefore, if I give, for example, a 1200 milliliter bolus of isotonic fluid, and it will all stay in the extracellular fluid space, about 300 of it will remain in the plasma and 900 will move into the interstitium. And that's at a ratio of one to three. That's why the classic teaching was for every milliliter of EBL, give three milliliters of isotonic crystalloid with the understanding that some of that fluid is going to leave the intravascular space. But as we've said before, and we'll continue to say, real fluid distribution is context sensitive, and this ratio is probably not correct. And certainly in real clinical situations like critical illness and major surgery, 
we hesitate to give this large volume of crystalloid empirically just based on a calculation from blood loss. Hypotonic fluids are available. If you think about it, a hypotonic fluid is basically some isotonic fluid with some free water added to it. Free water distributes to all compartments, extracellular and intercellular. Most of our hypotonic fluids contain some glucose. Glucose containing solutions are distributed to all the body fluid compartments because glucose is very quickly metabolized to carbon dioxide and water. It takes about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer during surgery. And so anytime you have something like D5 water, you can consider that as uh, free water, as a hypotonic solution. Using the same body fluid compartments that we discussed before, 1,200 mils of free water would distribute in a 1 to 3 to 8 ratio. 100 mils would stay in the plasma, 300 mils into the interstitium for a total of 400, but another 800 would move into the intracellular fluid. Hypertonic fluids will rapidly expand the extracellular fluid by pulling fluid out of the intracellular fluid. And if it's an electrolyte-based fluid, like 3% sodium chloride, we expect that effect to last for one to two hours. If it's a colloid-based hypertonic fluid, the effect could persist for even longer. This chart describes all of the common fluids that we use. It starts with normal plasma with our typical pH and electrolyte composition and osmolarity, and then gives for comparison sodium chloride, lactated ringers, D5 water and plasmolite, all crystalloids that we may commonly see used. We also have D5 half normal saline, then we have some hypertonic solu solutions, mannitol and saline, and finally albumin, which we'll discuss shortly. Colloids contain larger molecules that cannot easily cross the endothelial cells and, plas and cell membranes. Ideally, we would want to replace any plasma losses with iso-oncotic colloids. Right, colloids that have that same oncotic pressure in order to avoid redistribution out of the vasculature into the interstitium. It's a great idea, but it relies on some assumptions. It assumes that the endothelial barrier is intact and that these large molecules can't diffuse out of the vasculature. It also needs to take into account that colloidal volume effects are context sensitive. It depends on the patient's physiologic status. And again, we're going to discuss this more as we move through this topic. Colloids are more expensive than crystalloids. They may have some unfavorable side effects. And remember that one of the best colloids is blood. Replacing blood loss with blood makes a lot of sense. We expect blood to stay in the vasculature, especially whole blood. But of course, transfusion carries several risks as well. And that's a topic we'll get into a lot more detail next semester. There is an ongoing endless debate about benefits of colloids versus crystalloids. And in general, there has never been a good study that shows a clear benefit of colloids over crystalloids. The notion that colloids give you this long-term expansion is probably a myth. And in reality, the intravascular fluid expansion that you get from colloids lasts only a little bit longer than crystalloids, maybe a few hours. And after that, the colloid does start to move into the interstitium, and it can even stay in the interstitium for an extended period of time. The risk of developing edema is no different between colloids and crystalloids in most patient populations. And this 1 to 3 ratio that we were taught, the equivolume ratio between colloids and crystalloids, is probably much closer to 1 to 2 or even 1 to 1. And therefore, the advantage of colloids allowing us to use less volume to achieve intravascular volume expansion is probably not supported by any evidence and not an advised clinical practice. What are some colloids that you will see used? 
5% albumin is very common. It has an osmolarity of about 300 milliosmol, which is physiologic. You will see people using it for intravascular expansion, especially if blood is needed urgently and not immediately available. Notice that albumin does have a high sodium chloride content, and you can cause hypernatremia if you use a lot of albumin. But albumin will move across the endothelium into the interstitium, especially in critically ill patients who may have increased capillary leakage. And this will cause peripheral edema as the albumin becomes trapped in the interstitium and starts pulling fluid out of the vasculature into the interstitium. We also have 25% albumin, which has an osmolarity of 1,500 milliosmol. The idea was you could give someone a small amount of 25% albumin and it would use its oncotic pressure to pull fluid from the interstitium back into the intravascular space. In fact, this is probably not the case, as we will see soon. It may actually just be pulling volume out of the glycocalyx and causing further damage. Albumin has actually been associated with increased mortality, probably due to increased intracranial pressure, in patients who have traumatic brain injury. At the hospital where I work, people use an awful lot of albumin without any evidence-based um, reasoning and without a clear understanding of the accepted standard indications for albumin. So I wanted to give you, as a point of reference, what the official published guidelines suggest as indications for use of albumin. And this is here for your reference, but I'd just like to highlight patients who have hepatorenal syndrome, bacterial peritonitis with cirrhosis, patients who've had a large volume paracentesis, removal of fluid from the um, abdominal cavity, together with cirrhosis. Those are your main benefits. And then there may be some benefit in patients who are not doing well with crystalloid therapy after cardiac surgery, heart, lung, and liver transplantation, or other major hepatic or intestinal resections. But using it for septic or hemorrhagic shock, even for burns or nephrotic syndrome or intravascular volume expansion, really has very little, if any, benefit and may even be harmful in some of these patients. There are other colloids available, primarily heta starches like Hespan, Hextend, or Voluvin. These are synthetic colloids that have starches that are resistant to metabolism, um, and they are renally eliminated. Uh, the idea was, again, that they create an oncotic pressure in the intravascular space and retain fluid or increase fluid movement into the intravascular space. The older products actually had carried some risk of renal injury and coagulopathy. Newer products may be less risky, but they are very expensive. And once again, in critically ill patients, it's not clear that these products provide any significant benefit over goal-directed crystalloid therapy. That's the end of our discussion here about colloids, but we have much more to discuss about fluids, so stay tuned for the next recording.